Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Corcoran. I'm the CEO of Master Investor. Unfortunately, James Faulkner wasn't able to make it this afternoon, so I'm a late substitute. Our session this afternoon is going to cover the fundamentals of buy -to let in the post-Brexit and COVID-19 environment. Our speaker is Paul Mahoney. Uh, Paul is the founder and managing director of Nova Financial Group. So without further ado, I will hand over to Paul. Paul. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks for, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, as you say, my name is Paul Mahoney, founder and managing director at Nova Financial Group. We're a property investment advisory company um, for those who aren't familiar with us. So really our sort of key point of difference is that we're financial advisors who specialize in property investment um, and prefer property, to be honest, as, as the key asset class for our clients to, to um, build and store wealth. So that's what I'll talk to you about today. Um, the, the title of today's talk is <clears throat> the fundamentals of buy to let in the UK post COVID-19 and Brexit. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the tried and tested fundamentals that go into successfully investing in property. And also some of the, the, the key things to be aware of in the current market, how to overcome that and to survive and thrive. Uh, so um, I suppose I'll just talk to you a little bit at the start about myself so that you sort of understand who you're listening to and hopefully can see why there might be some value in listening to me. Uh, so I have been in the industry for 13 years. I previously ran a large financial services company in Australia, which we publicly listed. Um, I left the company, went to the UK and started Nova about six and a half years ago. We're now the industry leading uh, property investment advisory company in the UK. Um, we've assisted thousands of people to successfully invest in property and we have a very good reputation um, in, in the market, which you can see yourself if you simply Google Nova Financial Group. Um, I'm an experienced property investor and landlord myself. I've built a reasonable property portfolio um, across the UK and Australia. And I've also written a best-selling book on the topic, which I have here. Um, and I'm going to provide you all with the details on how you can get a free copy of that book. So the book is called The Property Pension Plan. It's a, it's a bestseller on Amazon in the UK and Australia uh, now. So we've had very positive feedback on it. And hopefully for those who find this webinar interesting, that might give you the opportunity to, to delve a bit deeper into the methodology that I'll talk about. So uh, without further ado, I will get stuck into some of the content. Um, and as Amanda uh, very kindly pointed out there, there will be the point, the opportunity uh, to ask some questions at the end of the talk. Uh, right, so as I mentioned, the title of the talk is the fundamentals of buy to let in the UK post COVID-19 and Brexit. Um, We'll start with a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, it's important for me to say that um, we are a regulated company. So anything that I talk about today is general in nature. It's not specific to your situation. You shouldn't necessarily act upon it or make changes to your finances or investments based upon what I'm talking about. Um, you should seek personal advice before doing that. And it just so happens that's something we can help you with on a one-to-one -one basis, believe it or not. Um, so each of you will have the opportunity following this webinar to have a one-to-one -one consultation with one of our senior client advisors to ask questions and determine how you might be able to implement some of these, the things I'm talking about, to potentially improve your financial position. That ties quite well into my next point. So I'll, I'll try to keep the terminology to a minimum. I assume there are probably people of varying levels of experience and knowledge here especially when it comes to property. So um, hopefully I, 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 you know, everything I, I say does make sense, but if anything doesn't make sense, then I strongly encourage you to ask questions, which we will come back to at the end of the talk. You know, a question that you have on your mind might be on somebody else's mind as well. So you're not just helping yourself, you're helping others. And I, I strongly I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to have this sort of live Q&A interaction, because I think from the webinars we've done, and we've done quite a lot, over the past 12 months since the whole pandemic situation came about. Um, the the Q&A has probably been the most productive part of them. So what am I going to talk about? Agenda for the talk, I'll start by introducing our company so that you understand the direction from which we're approaching this. I think that's important. I'll then talk about the importance of strategy, which is relevant not just to property, but really any, um, any investment approach or, or, any, or life in general. Um, then why leverage property, the key word there being leverage. 
And I think for those perhaps who might have previously had more of a focus toward equity, shares, whatever that might be, um, the, the, the key point that I find a lot of people haven't considered is what debt or mortgages or leverage or, or means essentially the same thing um, can do to property and why that really separates it um, from other types of investments. So I'll talk about that. What are the key fundamentals to give us confidence in performance? What are your investment options? So I'll compare leveraged property to other investment options and we'll look at some of the returns associated with those types of investments. Um, what are the current market trends in property in the UK, COVID-19 and Brexit and why they are relatively short term, refer to them there as speed bumps. But you know, property is a mid to long term investment. That's really where you make your money. And that's what it's all about. So we'll talk more about that and some five year predictions on growth. And then lastly, the free consultation and advice offer, uh, where I'll be waiving some fees um, for the, the webinar attendees today, assuming that there's the potential for us as a business to add value. So I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. So uh, first off, Nova Financial Group. So I assume some of you are probably familiar with us. We have been exhibiting at the Master Investor Show now for three or four years. Um, we've spoken with many people about why property probably makes sense as part of their portfolio or part of their overall investment approach. But um, for those who haven't heard about us, Nova Financial Group is the overarching brand under which a number of different companies sit that all work very closely together to assist our clients to improve their financial position through investing in property. So how we do that is we first off help people better understand their current situation, their goals, their preferences, you know, what's point A, what's point B, what's the gap between the two, and put in place a strategy for shutting that gap. Um, once we have the strategy, we need to implement it. So we do all the research and due diligence that goes into sourcing the most suitable properties from the market specific to each individual client's criteria. So we source properties. We have an in-house mortgage brokerage, so we advise on and arrange the finance. We also provide property management services UK-wide, so we manage the properties. And then we work with our clients on an ongoing basis to help them review and reinvest as it makes sense to do so. So ideally, it's, it's an ongoing process and it's very much end to end. So from the, from the start of the journey through to the end and actually achieving the lifestyle and financial goals that our clients have set out to achieve. Um, we have two biggest points of difference from most other property companies. First off, we don't have anything to sell. So most property companies are selling a book or a list of properties. And therefore, you know, even if they don't want it to be, their advice or their guidance or their sale is going to be biased toward what they are selling. Um, whereas we have access essentially to the whole market and therefore the focus is on what's right for the client. Secondly, we're financial advisors who specialize in property. So I wouldn't even necessarily call us property people. We are much more focused on the financial outcomes of investing in property um, and therefore have a much more financial planning approach to it um, then, you know, an estate agent who's trying to sell you a property, for example. Um, qualifications and experience. Well, I'm a qualified financial advisor and mortgage advisor. I've been in the industry for 13 years and I'm supported by a team with over 100 years of experience across property and financial services. We've helped thousands of people successfully invest in property. Um, and that is very much backed up by, you know, the reviews across all platforms um, so we have a good reputation in the industry, which shows we have been doing the right thing by people for the past six and a half years, which, you know, as an advisory business, that's not necessarily an easy thing to keep everybody happy, but we always do our best to try to do so. And then lastly, we have very strong relationships in the UK property market, which opens the right doors for us and therefore for our clients, so we can pass on the best possible deals. So in a nutshell, that's what we do as a business. And I suppose the hope here is that perhaps we might be able to help some of you that have attended the webinar today to, to continue to work toward your financial goals through building property as part of your, your portfolio. Um, right, so strategy. Uh, your strategy is very important. And it does surprise me how many um, people who invest heavily in anything really, you know, whether that be stocks and shares or property or whatever it might be, don't particularly have any real, any real strategy in place. And I kind of liken that to jumping in your car and driving aimlessly. You know, if, if you do that, you're probably unlikely to end up somewhere desirable. And even if you do, it's only by accident. Now, when we're talking about something as important as your financial future and the, the, your comfort in, in retirement, for example, that, that, that's quite important. And therefore we don't want to go about that accidentally or, or ad hoc. Um, we want to be quite purposeful 
in what we're trying to achieve. And a strategy is what allows us to do that. It doesn't need to be set in stone. It can change every day if you like, but at least we have one and we have something to follow. That helps remove guesswork, it gives more peace of mind, allows you to account for contingencies. If you're doing it through the means of getting advice like through our company, um, you can benefit from experience. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to make all of the mistakes that people commonly make because we've been there, we've done it, and we can help you overcome those things. It also allows you to take more of a business approach. Now, when it comes to property investment, most people who know what they're talking about will agree with me that property investment is no longer a hobby. There's been lots of changes in the market, such as Section 24, the stamp duty premiums, mortgage serviceability, they're the three big ones over the past five years, which means that a strategy that perhaps worked quite well five years ago, maybe doesn't work so well now. And a strategy that perhaps didn't work so well five years ago, maybe worked quite well now. And you need to know how that applies to you and how you make sure you're implementing the right approach. And then lastly is a little story. So there was a study of the Harvard MBA 90, class of 1985. And they asked them, do you have clearly defined goals and are they written down? 3% did, and they were written down. 27% had no particular, well, sorry, had goals, but they weren't written down. And 70% had no particular goals at all. Now they surveyed the same group 10 years later and the 3% were earning 10 times as much as the 97% combined. So the moral to that story is the simple act of writing out your goals and a bit of an idea of how you're going to go about achieving those goals gives you a far greater chance of actually achieving them. So I think if there's one thing you take from this webinar, you know, we're, we're, we're toward the end of Feb now, but if you haven't written down your goals for 2021, I would strongly encourage you to do so. And a bit of an understanding of how you're actually going to go about achieving those goals, or perhaps that's something that we could help you go about doing in reviewing a situation and determining ways in which you might be able to improve. That's one of the first things we do in that initial consultation I referred to. So why leveraged property? I mentioned the key word here being leverage. Um, now, a lot of people associate, um, you know, the word debt, for example, is quite a negative word. And a lot of people look at debt as a bad thing. But when it comes to investment debt, and especially investment debt associated with property, it's not a bad thing. It's actually quite a good thing. And if we compare, for example, um, debt for property versus debt for investing in shares, so margin loans, for example, we invest in property, we're, it's, we're at very cheap interest rates. So you can borrow 75% at a 2 or 3% interest rate over the long term. So, you know, 10, 20 year plus terms um, with zero ability for the lender to recall that mortgage, regardless of what happens to the value of your property. So even if the value of your property falls substantially, so long as you are servicing the mortgage, you know, paying for the interest, there's nothing the lender can do in a bad market. Therefore, you can see out that bad market, which generally doesn't last very long with property. Your know, most downturns in property only last six to 18 months, and then the market recovers again, but you can see out that bad time. Whereas with margin loans, for example, you're at much higher interest rates of you know five, six, 7%, um, shorter terms. And lastly, of course, if the value of your portfolio falls, you have to either sell or put in more cash at the worst possible time. So the debt associated with property is much more, uh, much less risk, and it gives us, it therefore gives us the ability to um, to leverage up to sort of seventy five percent plus, and which means that if we're achieving relatively average returns on the asset value, the property you're buying, for example, we can get really good returns on our cash. So let's look at an example of that. So simple example of fifty thousand pounds cash invested into a two hundred thousand pound property. So you've got a 75% loan to value mortgage, you're borrowing 150 grand. Now, the, the, bet, the minimum benchmark that we would set for a yield on a net yield on funds applied, and that's quite key there, funds applied, is a lot of people look at gross yields for property, which might be four, five, six percent. But gross yields to you as an investor are pretty much irrelevant because they don't account for any of the costs. And there are costs in owning property. Whereas net yields on funds applied is all about the post cost return on the cash you've actually put in, which is the most important type of return. Um, sorry, guys, I'm, I'm talking to you from Australia today and it's quite warm here and I don't mean to brag, but that's why I'm sweating. Um, so, um, right, so minimum benchmark of 5%. So a 50 grand investor, that's two and a half thousand pounds of post tax 
uh, sorry, post expenses, pre-tax income. And usually for what, for the properties our clients invest in, it's somewhere between five and 10%. So that's two and a half to 5,000 pounds of net cash flow, which, you know, for one property, that's not a huge amount of money, but it's not a bad return. You know, when we're talking sort of almost guaranteed returns, because if we're investing in good properties in good areas, we're going to be very, very confident in rentability. Um, and that's actually going into your pocket on a yearly basis. But it's really where you build the portfolio that becomes more substantial. If we're talking 10 properties, that's 25 to 50,000 pounds of passive income, um, which, you know, I don't think anyone would say no to. Now, in the short term, that's more about creating a safety net and accounting for costs. Where you really make your money in property is through capital growth. Now, the UK average for capital growth over the past 20 years is 5.5% per annum. Now, that 20 years includes two recessions. We had the dot-com bubble in 1999-2000. We had the credit crunch in 08-09. Um, and maybe we're going to have another one now. That It happens. You know, we, we know that there's economic cycles. But the good thing about property is that economic cycles don't really matter because there's never really a bad time to buy good properties in good areas. And I'll, I'll talk to you about why in a moment, because it's much more about the average over the mid to long term. But let's say we, we can get slightly less than the UK average. And let's say we're confident in getting 5% growth per annum, which is very, very achievable. You know, the UK last year grew by somewhere between five and 6% on average, depending on who you ask. All the, the indexes are slightly different, but five to 6% when we were in a pandemic for nine months. So that's not bad going really. Um, but 5% on the asset value, so 200,000 pound property, 5% on that makes it worth 210,000. So a 10,000 pound uplift in value. Now that 10,000 pound uplift in value is a 20% uplift in value on the cash we've applied being the 50 grand because it increased in value from 50 grand to 60 grand. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's 20% return on our cash. Now the way we access that uplift is by remortgaging the property to release the equity and reinvest it. So that's what we refer to as the snowball effect, the, the self-perpetuating growth of property. As the property grows itself, we can access that equity and we can turn it into another property and take back, take back your initial investment. Um, so let's look at that return. We're at 25 to 30% per annum, fairly confidently because that's being driven, <coughs> excuse me, by average returns on the asset value. Um, now, I'm yet to hear a logical argument that tells me that 25 to 30% per annum is a bad return. It's not. It's a very good return. If we compare it to other types of investments, maybe some funds will give you that one or two years in a row, but they're very unlikely to give it to you 10 years in a row. Um, whereas here, it's not the actual investment that's giving us that return, but we are getting that return on our cash invested, which is really what it's all about. Because with that cash, we could do what we like. We could put it under our bed. We could invest it in you know, Apple or, or Amazon or whatever you want. Um, or in this case, we've invested in property with leverage. And it's the leverage that gets us that fantastic return with confidence. So over 10 years, we're tripling our money. Over three to four years, we're doubling our money because that puts us at 100%. And that's when you can take back your initial investment by remortgaging the property back up to 75% and then taking that 50 grand and buying a second property. So over three to four years, we've bought, we've turned one into two, another three to four years, we turned two into four, another three to four years, we turned four into eight. So within a 10 to 15 year period, it's quite achievable to turn one property into eight properties without investing any further cash yourself. Um, and that's very interesting as well. And that's driven by quite average returns on the asset values, multiplying the ability to have many properties, which gives us more exposure and more ability for growth, which means we've got eight lots of 50 grand investments. So we've turned 50 grand into 400 grand equity across those eight properties, which you know, is, is, is very interesting and very achievable. Um, and you can't really do that with any other asset um, class or any other type of investment. So how do we give ourselves confidence in actually getting those at least average um, outcomes from property investment. Now, of course, hopefully we'd be confident in doing slightly better than average, but we don't necessarily have to, to do well. And that's the key here. Property investment isn't necessarily about setting the world on fire, but rather getting good properties in good areas that are at least going to track that average 
um, and that's going to give us a good outcome on the funds we've invested. So first off, the biggest risk for leveraged property is having a tenant. Well, I'll go for, for one step back. The biggest risk is servicing your costs. There are costs associated with owning property and, and, the, and the main way you service those costs is by having a tenant that pays you rent. If you've got a tenant with good properties that, that the costs aren't too high and the yields are strong, the, the, the rent will more than service the costs. And therefore, we want to make sure there's a large tenant pool and strong tenant demand in that location. Now, to do that, we need to understand, well, what do these tenants want? And a big one is employment. So we want to be investing in locations that have a broad range of industries, providing a vast range of employment. Um, very relevant to the current situation in the UK. Probably the biggest risk to the UK economy and, their, and therefore also property is, is job loss. And there's already been some due to COVID-19. There will likely be more at the end of the furlough scheme, which I believe is the end of next month, unless that changes. Um, so that will impact certain locations a lot more than others because a lot of UK, smaller UK cities and towns are predominantly driven by one industry or even one company. And that's quite risky because if that one industry or company starts to struggle or moves away, then, then arguably so too does demand in that, that location. Um, whereas if you're investing in bigger cities with a broad range of industries such as London, Birmingham, Manchester, where you've got you know, pretty well all industries represented um, on scale, if one starts to struggle, then you have others that can fill the gaps. So that's quite important. Infrastructure is important as well. So large infrastructure being roads and rail, small being facilities and amenities. So shops, restaurants, bars, cafes, gyms. What we're looking to do here is tick as many of the boxes as we can, so far as what potential tenants and potential future buyers want. If we can tick at all of those boxes or as many of those boxes as possible, um, then that gives people a reason to want or need to live there. And if we have a really strong reason for people to want or need to live there, then we can be confident in there always being demand for the property and therefore confident in positive outcomes from that investment. Socioeconomic levels. So the demographics of the target market are important to understand. Who is your target market? Um, also, what do they want? We need to make sure the demand is skewed in our favour toward the type of property we're buying. For example, you don't want to be buying a one bedroom flat in a family oriented area or vice versa, you know, a four bedroom house in a, in a young professional oriented area where most people are either living on their own or as couples. So it's important to understand those figures. A good balance between yield and growth prospects is important. Gro yield creates safety. Growth is really where you make your money or at least where you build your portfolio. And then lastly, what we're looking for here is positive growth and change. So I think far too many people assume that the UK property market moves as one. It definitely does not. Uh, there are many microclimates within the overall UK property market. Um, you know, one example is historically London has performed quite well, but over the past five years, it hasn't. And other cities such as Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, have sort of taken over as the cities that are growing in value. And now that's being driven by various different things like job growth, population growth, infrastructure spending, a whole range of things that are making those cities a lot better. So that's what we're looking for is the best possible locations that are driven by really strong individual driving factors. And, and that means that regardless of what happens to the overall UK property market, we can still do well if we have strong driving factors that make that particular location do well. So you want to take a, a, a sort of microeconomic approach to investing in property rather than looking at the whole market or, or even having confidence in which way the UK property market is going. It's almost irrelevant when you get down to specific locations. So this is a graph from a report from a research house called Rigglesworth. Um, it's a little bit dated, but it looks at buy to let from the, the year that buy to let mortgages first become, came available in 1996 through to 2013, so 18 years, and the report was titled Buy to Let Comes of Age, you know, 18 years um, into it being a sort of a thing in the UK. And what it looked at was the average return on the average returns on the, cap, on the capital applied to a 75% leveraged buy to let property, which over that time frame was 16.3% net returns and compared it to other asset classes. So cash bought property, 
commercial property, the FTSE or share index, gilts and cash. And as you can see, property substantially outperformed, partially because of the, the ability for debt. So we've already spoken about that, but the debt definitely multiplies the returns and the debt is much cheaper now than it was then. Um, but even so, even the asset class as a cash board asset still outperformed. So I suppose this is why we like property uh, as the predominant asset class for a broad range of people because the risks are quite low um, and we can be confident in getting strong returns on the cash invested. So some of the current market trends in, in UK property. So substitution of space for place. So the repopulation of city centres. Now, this might fly in the face of some news articles that have been published lately um, due to COVID-19 and people working in city centres less and therefore potentially wanting to move away from city centres. But keep in mind that COVID-19 has only really been a thing in the UK for less than 12 months. Um, now, I, I do agree that more people will work from home um, even once COVID-19 is a thing of the past, because businesses have been forced into um, allowing it to happen. Even my business, you know, we, we have an office in the city in London. We never would have um, worked predominantly from home, but of course we've had to for the past um, 10 or 11 months. Um, and, and we likely will continue to do that in some capacity. I think we'll still, we'll have always have an office, we'll always work in the office, but potentially working from home, you know, one, two, three days a week, whatever it might be. And I think a lot of business owners are thinking the same. Now, what's important to keep in mind, though, is that employment and where you work isn't the only reason why you live in a location. You know, for example, I, I am in Australia at the moment, but I usually live in Zone 2 London. Um, and that there are more reasons than, than proximity to the office uh, as to why I live in Zone 2 London, you know, that all, all the other reasons such as bars, restaurants, job, uh, bars, restaurants, cafes, gyms, you know, all the things I like being close to that make my lifestyle enjoyable, you know, in spite of when, when all this COVID stuff's behind us, um, is why I like living there. Um, now, moving, the further I move away, from that central location, the less and less I have of each of those things. So keeping in mind that young professionals have a strong preference for having these things on their doorstep. Um, I think that this is a generational trend in that if you look at the baby boomers, they were much more family focused. They um, had children earlier, got married earlier. They wanted the large family home and they were happy to live a bit further from, from work to do that or from the center to do that. Whereas young professionals have different preferences now. Yeah, and they're predominantly driving the rental market. You know, there's, there's less of a focus on home ownership. There's more of a focus on lifestyle and experiences. Um, and, and having all of those facilities I mentioned close by is very important to young professionals. You know, we get a lot of young people coming to our business now who, you know, in the past probably would have just moved away from London and bought a home, you know, out, out further out where they could afford. But now a lot of them are continuing to rent and they're investing in places like Birmingham and Manchester because they, they, they want to keep living in the area they like living in, but they also want to own property. So that there is definitely a shift there in generational preferences. That's resulting in the repopulation of city centres. Manchester is a perfect example of that. Um, 20 years ago in Manchester, there was only a thousand people living in the city centre. It was mostly retail and commercial space. Um, and now there's 30,000. So 30 times the amount of people um, in a relatively small space. And that's that's largely converted that area to, to, to a lot more residential. Um, younger generations moving or staying north. So this is probably something a lot of a lot of you have heard of, have heard of happening, you know, and, and the biggest driver of this, uh, you know, over that similar sort of 20 year time frame is 20 years ago, wages in London were comparatively high and and the cost of living was much lower than it is today. Now, since then, wages haven't risen an awful lot but the cost of living substantially has. Um, and therefore, the, the quality of life in London uh, for low to middle income earners and young professionals fit into that bracket is not very good. It's an expensive place to live and it's a difficult place to live if you don't have money. Um, whereas if you go to places like Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, the cost of living is substantially less. Wages have caught up. So you can now earn very similar money in those cities to what you can in London, depending on your industry, but overall, on average, you can. And, you know, the cost of living is substantially less. Property prices are substantially less. So getting your foot on the property ladder 
you know, going out for a nice meal, all those sorts of things is much, much cheaper. And therefore the quality of life is better. So people are either staying there or they're even moving there or they're staying there after university. So the postgraduate retention rates in those cities are much higher than they've ever been before. And that's obviously benefiting these, those cities with you know, these young bright minds. So I mentioned before all the changes in property. So section 24, the mortgage serviceability changes and stamp duty premiums. All of those changes are hurting high value, low yield properties. So predominantly London and the Southeast, and they're benefiting lower value, high yielding properties because that's causing a bit of a shift in the market. You know, people who previously invested in London solely for growth and didn't really get much cash flow, that their, their properties quite often now will be going into negative cash flow, which could make their strategy unviable. So what's happening with the whole COVID-19 and Brexit situation? So interestingly, um, 2020 was actually quite a good year for property price growth. On average, it was around five to 6%, depending on who you ask. Um, it was even stronger in, in the likes of the cities I've been referring to. You probably got from the, the, what I've been saying is that our focus has predominantly been the Midlands and the Northwest because those areas have the strongest fundamentals in comparison to any other location. Um, and those, those areas grew by more than that, you know, six, seven, eight percent, depending on which city we're talking about. Hopefully 2021 you know, results in some economic stability with the vaccine being rolled out and, you know, hopefully the return to, to sort of normality around June time. Uh, pretty well all research houses are saying that prime central locations are expected to do best. So that's the, the city centre and surrounding areas of major cities like London, Birmingham, Manchester. Um, for all the reasons we discussed here, because you have the most depth in each of these factors in and around major cities. And five-year predictions from pretty well all research houses has remained the same as well. So although some are saying that prices might dip over the next 12 to 18 months, most are saying it will recover very quickly. And over the next five years from, you know, even going back to sort of start of last year through to five years from then, um, that the, the property price growth will remain quite good and relatively unchanged um, from before COVID-19 existed. Um, so here's some predictions from Savills. Uh, as you can see, the Northwest is predicted to perform the best. Uh, that they actually, with their most recent update, in, in, increased the returns that expected for the Northwest. But the Midlands and the Northwest are the areas that, that do have the strongest fundamentals when you consider all factors. Um, so that's my slides. I hope that everybody's enjoyed that so far and found it useful. What I'm going to share with you now is just a couple of resources that I hope are also useful for everyone. Um, so first off is our website. So that's nova.financial. Um, if I can just encourage you to check that out now and just type it into your browser, it's obviously say on the webinar, but um, on, our webinar, on, on our website, you can find out a lot more information about us, but more relevant to you is there's lots of educational resources. So if you're interested in property or interested in learning more about property, there's lots to, to digest here. Um, I mentioned my best-selling book. So there's a banner at the bottom of the page here or this button here, which will take you to this page. Um, I hope that it's okay for me to just copy this link over, guys. I, I didn't ask the, the Master Investor Show people before this, but I hope that's okay. Um, excellent, thank you. So there is the link to get a free copy of the book. Just click on that. Rather than paying 15 pounds on Amazon plus postage, you will pay five pounds for postage. Um, so that's a, for the, the hard copy, the physical copy of our book, which we will post out to you. Um, or you can get the book in audible version. So that's on the, or, the audiobook platform for Amazon. Hope you like the sound of my voice though, because I spent two days recording that on Tottenham Court Road. Um, or there's also an ebook version on Amazon as well. Um, I host and feature on a number of TV shows. So one called Proper Wealth, another one called Property Elevator, which is pretty much the, the dragon's den of property development. I'm one of the angel investors on that show. We've got over 100 hours of educational video there now, a couple of podcasts and lots of other things to digest. So I strongly encourage you to check out those resources. If, if you found what I've talked about at all interesting, and you'd like to learn a little bit more, that's a good place to start. Great, excellent. I hope everybody found this found this good so far. Um, and I suppose now we'll move on to some questions. Thanks Paul. Yeah, we've had a number of questions submitted during the session. We also had a few submitted beforehand. So I'll start with the ones that have been submitted live. So 
Uh, Kimberly asks, what types of property cannot be leveraged? Good question. Um, so predominantly, the only types of properties that, that cannot be, well, th th there's probably numerous different sort of obscure types, but the main ones that come to mind is, for example, purpose-built student accommodation. So pro you've probably seen properties being advertised, student pods and those types of properties. They generally can't be leveraged because they're considered more commercial properties. So even with commercial finance, usually they're, they're cheaper as well. So they're usually between 50 and 100,000 pounds and they, they are usually a cash purchase. Whereas really any type of residential property, um, you know, buy to let, um, even mixed use. So you could have residential above a shop, um, most types of property that, that can be let, um, so therefore generates an income, can be leveraged. Good. Um, question here from Jonathan. Uh, how much have the changes in tax rules around interest deductions reduced your returns in the UK? Good question. So what you're referring to there is Section 24, and that's a change with regards to the tax deductibility of buy-to-let mortgage interest for higher rate taxpayers. So that's an important point is the, 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 the government didn't clarify this real or didn't explain it very well, but it only applies if you're a higher rate taxpayer. So if you're earning more than 50,000 pounds um, personally and the properties are in your personal name. And there's a few ways around this because a lot of our clients are couples and one is on a high income and one is on little to no income. Now in that case, you can fill in a form 17 and have your property income go to your partner and you would avoid section 24 altogether. The other way of avoiding it is by investing through a limited company. So most people that are making new purchases with leverage, um, you know, about 70% in fact, in the final quarter of last year are doing so through a limited company. So section 24 doesn't apply to a limited company. If the, the section 24 mainly hurts people who have large portfolios with a high level of debt. Um, we, and also sort of tight, tight profit margins from a, from a cash flow perspective, um, that those people are hurting due to Section 24, whereas others, certainly if you're starting out or you're still building, there are definitely ways around it. Um, another one from Jonathan. Um, is stamp duty an issue and what are the efficient ways of investing? I think it probably relates to what you just said. Yeah, uh, it does a little bit. So they do bring in a stamp. So the other change is the stamp duty premium. Um, so, so there's a premium applied, a 3% premium applied for, for, buy to, for not buy to let purchases actually specifically. And then again, this is something that hasn't been explained very well. Tax is always a bit of a muddy area. Um, everything, nothing black and white, but um, it's for subsequent property purchases. So for example, if you own a home and you buy a second property, then you pay a 3% stamp duty premium for that second property and any subsequent property thereafter. You know, I wouldn't say that's too much of an issue you're buying a 200,000 pound property, it's an extra 6,000 6, pounds that you're paying. Now, you know, that is an extra cash outlay, but you get that back pretty quickly. You know, we spoke before about an average of 5% growth per annum. You know, you, you, therefore you're getting back your, your 3% in just over six months. So yes, it's an extra cost, but it's certainly not a reason to, to not invest. Right, um, question here from uh, no name on it. Which is a better investment, new build or conversion flats? Yeah, okay. So, so there's been lots of conversions in the UK recently um, due to permitted development rights. So that's uh, all about uh, the government allowing developers to go in and, and buy either disused or, or underutilised buildings that are maybe office space or commercial space and convert it to flats um, or convert it to, to residential housing. Um, so there's lots of that. If it's done well, conversions can be great. You know that there are you know i owned a, a, a mill conversion property um and they can be really cool if they're done well um there's lots of them around the midlands and the northwest um if they're done poorly they can be quite poor as well though you know you, you sometimes do see and it's been referred to in the media um sort of slum 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 lord type stuff where um you know they convert really ugly looking office buildings and one of the downsides to um, committed development rights is you can't change the facade of the building. So if you've got an ugly looking building, it's going to remain an ugly looking building. So that's one of the downsides to conversions. But what you know, I suppose one of the upsides as well is usually developers are getting them at quite a good price. 
so they can sell them at quite a good price as well. So I wouldn't say one is better, what new build is or, or conversions, one is better than the other. It depends on the specific property you're talking about, because some conversions I would say are much better than a lot of new builds and others are much worse. Great. Uh, I think the, uh, the comments you, you made earlier about buying through a, a limited company have generated quite a few questions. So this one from Philip says, corporate ownership, isn't it hard to find mortgages? Uh, yeah, good question. So, so it's it's slightly well. Uh, it, it's fair to say it's slightly harder than buying in your own name, but it's certainly not. I wouldn't say it's hard. I wouldn't say hard is the right word for it. Um, the only reason it's slightly harder is because you don't actually, you know, own the property that your company does. You, the, the the lender wants to give, wants you to give a personal guarantee and wants to involve you in the loan. And that's fair enough, because if you own it in your own name, that would be the case anyway. But generally, you do need a, a certain level of minimum income, um, which is usually about 20 or 25,000 pounds, which most people have anyway. Um, the, the interest rates are slightly higher, but we're talking sort of half a percent, so not, not an awful lot. Um, you know, I, I personally have a, have a reasonable portfolio all through limited company or com little companies. Um, and and I, I don't find it hard to, find, to get mortgages at all. So, so no, it, it's not hard to get mortgages. You, you should deal with a specialist buy to let mortgage broker because you'd be surprised how many mortgage brokers pretty much solely do residential and they are two different products. Um, and if you don't have the, the knowledge or the expertise or familiar with the lenders that specialize in you know, limited company buy to let mortgages, then perhaps you won't, won't be giving the best advice. So, so no, it's not hard. Um, you just need to be aware of what's required. Great. Okay. Um, this question here from David it says, how will the student four and five bed house market be affected by the impacts of COVID experience on demand for student places at university and the impact of the huge boom in student blocks? Yeah. Um, well, you know, in, in the short term, COVID's obviously had quite a big impact on student housing. It's also had a big impact on short term lets. You know, we, we've got 15 units in Birmingham that were, were all planned for the short term let market, um, which is pretty much not, not dried up, but, you know, all the reasons that people use short term lets pretty much don't exist at the moment. Things like entertainment and sport and business travel, there's still a little bit of that, but not a lot. Um, so yeah, th th those in the short term, those markets have been impacted, but w the idea is we're hopefully returning back to some sort of normality over the next three to six months. Um, so those markets will come back. Um, you know, the, the, the big student blocks, yes, they will have an impact on student accommodation as well. You know, I'm not a huge fan of student accommodation, to be honest, as an investment for partly due to that reason, but, but also just due to the, the, the types of tenants you need to deal with, they can be a bit of a headache. Um, we, we much prefer dealing with young professionals um, as tenants because they, they've got money, that they, they take pride in where they live and they just don't tend to give you anywhere near as much headaches as a student does. Okay, a uh, question here from Just uh, who says, do you get hit with stamp duty if you transfer your private portfolio into a limited company? You can, yeah. So. Um, unless you get incorporation relief or, or unless you go through what's referred to as a hybrid structure where you set up a, a, a partnership and then you, you sort of um, you transition into a trust type structure, which can be quite costly. Um, we, you know, we generally don't entertain the idea of people doing that unless they have a real problem. You know, if you've got one or two properties and they'd be slightly more tax efficient in a limited company than in your own name, it's not worth doing it. It's going to cost you too much. It's the cost is going to outweigh the benefit. But if you've got 40 properties with high levels of debt and you'd be substantially better off in the company structure, then it's probably worth incurring the costs and the headache of, of making that transfer. Okay. Um, question here from Roy. So I'm firing these questions at you. <laughs> um, Roy asks, can you get tax relief on interest payments when buying through a limited company? Yes. 100% tax relief. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question here from Robert, who says, as I understand it, uh, you're saying that after your initial purchase, based on 25% profit per annum, you will be able to purchase a second property after four years. How can you touch the profits to buy the second property 
if you retain the original property without selling it? Good question. So I think I did cover this, but maybe I didn't explain it well enough. So the way you, you're able to access those profits or, or equity that you've created through the property growing in value is you remortgage the property. So let's say, for example, I buy a property for £100,000 and in four years time, it's worth £150,000. I can then remortgage that property and access that equity that's been created by taking the mortgage back up to 75%. And then that, that equity that's been created there goes to me as cash from the lender. And then I can use that to buy a second property. So, so it's, it's by remortgaging. And that sort of three to four year time frame works quite well with remortgaging anyway, because most products um, that are available for buy to let are two, three or five years. So you would stick with them for that time frame, And that's likely when you'd be seeking a new mortgage anyway. So you get a revaluation, and then you will do, then you will find out how much accessible equity there is available. Right. Uh, question from Anne, who says, "What if you want to leverage something like a masonette in Zone Five London to buy in the Midlands or the Northwest?" Yeah. Um, I, 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 it seems from the question that there might be something wrong with that, but I, I don't. I don't see anything wrong with that on on the surface of it. Um, you know, a masonette, there's nothing wrong with a masonette. It's just a one bedroom house, a one floor house, really. Um, not one bedroom house, a one floor house. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with, with leveraging a property that you already exist. A, a lot of people that we deal with have a, a, a lot of equity tied up in their home. And I think this is a trap that a lot of people get stuck in is they buy the most expensive home they can afford. They spend their whole life paying it off and they end up with a really nice home, but no investments. Um, so accessing the equity in your home can be quite sensible sometimes, using that to start to build a, an investment portfolio, um, which is something we do for people on a daily basis. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with what you've suggested there. Um, so, obviously, depending on the situation, it could be sensible. <laughs> um, question from Anonymous here. Do you operate in Northern Ireland? Um, well, it depends what you mean by operate. Um, so we operate worldwide. Um, we're based in London. We have satellite offices in Manchester and Birmingham. Uh, we don't usually recommend property in Northern Ireland just because we feel as though there are other places that are more, that make a better investment, but we deal with people all over the world. Um, you know, and, and this is a, a good point, actually. I'm glad you've asked the question is that, you know, a lot of our clients that live in London, for example, say, oh, I'm not too sure about investing in Manchester. It's, you know, two or three hours away. And because we manage the whole process and make it all very easy, you know, something I often say is that you know, our clients that are in Australia, their investments perform just as well as our, as our clients that live next door to them. Because you know, we, we manage the whole process, we, we make it all very easy and you don't, you don't ever necessarily have to go to your properties um, to make them perform well. Okay, uh, so the question on the chat, which says, what's your opinion on timing? to buy a property, i.e. wait a few minutes or buy now? Good question. So a quote that I'm sure I stole off someone at some point, but I quite often get quoted on it, is that property investment is not about time in the market. It's about time in the market. So for it's very relevant to our current situation, a very common question we get is, what if the market dips by 5% over the next 12 to 18 months? Should I wait to see if that happens? And the answer is no because it very well could go up by five or 6% over that same time frame, and then you'll be kicking yourself. So don't, don't try to time the market. No one knows the direction of the market. Anyone who tells you they do is pulling your leg. They, no one knows. We don't know. No one understands the intricacies of property economics that determines exactly what's going to happen. But keep in mind that let's say you've got your 50 grand in the bank and you could buy a 200,000 pound property. You're going to be getting some net yield on that money as well. So that's any downfall in value will likely get back, but also keeping in mind, you probably won't even know the value's fallen because you're not going to be revaluing for at least two, three or five years. And it's much more about the, the average returns over five to 10 years. And so long as you're confident, it's a good property in a good area with the right fundamentals, you know, the right ingredients to drive it in the right direction, that's what's important. So <laughs> um, question here from Jean Quill. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Do age limits apply to residential mortgages uh, for buy to let? 
Good question. So, so just to correct your question slightly, because um, I know what you're asking, but you asked it slightly wrong. What I, what I mean by not being rude there. What See, I that mean was my fault rather than Tom. <laughs> no, that's okay. So, so re a residential mortgage is is a is a regulated product for buying a home, and therefore, yes, there are restrictions on that, and it's usually up to retirement age. Whereas buy to let mortgages are commercial mortgages. They're much less regulated. They're much more flexible. And the serviceability for a buy to let mortgage is the property you're buying, the rent from the property you're buying. So it's much less to do with your personal situation. And therefore there are some lenders that will lend to you up to the age of 100 for a buy to let mortgage um, because they know they've got the security of the property and the rent is going to service the mortgage. Re even if you're, even if you're you know, bedridden, it doesn't matter because the rent's still coming in. Um, so, 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 so there are much less restrictions, and you know, most of us don't live to the age of one hundred. So, so you know, there's not really any age restriction on select mortgages. Okay. Um, question here from anonymous: uh, How do you get around the minimum salary level to get the first loan? Can the existing rental income on the property be uh, be leveraged to be used? I can't see the question, and you kind of. Um, uh, skipped a little bit there. Was it minimum salary level? Yes. And can the rental income be leveraged? Okay. Yeah. Um, not usually the first investment. Um, so usually when you're making your first investment into buy to let, there will be a minimum income required. And that's just to give the lender a mind. But usually that minimum income level is quite low. So some lenders is only 15 grand. Some it's 20, some it's 25. Now, most people have that, I find. With the most people we deal with have that. If you don't have that, um, then there might be ways around it. For example, if you already own a home, that gives the lender a bit more peace of mind. And I do believe there are some buy to let lenders that will lend to you without any personal income if you already own a home. So that, that's probably the answer. Okay. Uh, we've got more questions coming in, but I'm conscious that it's getting on towards midnight where you are, Paul. <laughs> um, that's okay. Oh, look, I, I'm happy to see you, but Excellent. you know, obviously, comes to your time as well. I'll, I'll fire some more at you in that case. Um, so, uh, another anonymous question here: uh, by auction or private treaty? Sorry, Tim. I, I don't know whether that was me or you, but I lost you there. Um, so, the, the question was. Uh, would you advise uh, buying at auction or via private treaty? Yes. I think, I, I the, think, I think the technology might, might be getting the better of I lost the bid after auction. <laughs> or or uh, it says here private treaty. Okay. Yeah, so just, just generally purchase. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, it can be good, but it's not for the faint-hearted and it's not for beginners um you know properties that are at all of them that is very mainstream um, and normal properties go up for auction in australia they don't so much in the uk usually auction properties have an issue and you need to understand what that issue is and be confident in fixing it you have your funds lined up whether that be as a cash purchase or something like that so it, it buying it all much more hands-on and therefore you you kind of need to know what you're doing with property auction and do well out of it you don't really want to be doing that as a, on the side or just as a hobby or, or as a beginner um can do well if you're doing it if you do it well though um whereas predominantly what we do for our clients is, is quite passive investing so you know our clients so as mum and dad investors usually that they've got a job and they've got a family which takes up the balance of their time um, and they've got some spare resources they want to invest want to be getting their hands dirty or applying too much of their time to do it and that's what we do for them to make it all very easy and, and it's i suppose a bit more of a um low great thank you paul uh, i think we're starting to get a bit of interference we've still got a, oh, a few questions but what i would suggest is um Paul will we'll be sharing his slides with uh, with everyone following this event. You'll also be able to view the video on the Master Investor YouTube channel. Um, 
And if you do have any questions, I think Paul has put up his his, uh, his website and his details already. So um, you can either contact Paul directly, or if you prefer, you can contact us and we can pass your details on to Paul. He can respond. Absolutely. Directly. Look, I'll, I'll give everyone my, my, my direct email address. I've just put in the chat section. So that's pm at nova.financial. Feel free to send me an email and I'll be more than happy to try to help. Good stuff. Right, well, uh, that, that's been fascinating. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us. I hope you've all found that useful. Um, there will be a, a, the next Master Investor event, I think, is scheduled for the 4th of March, which will be looking at cultivated meat and alternative proteins. So a little bit different. Um, I, hope, I hope you all have good afternoons, or in Paul's case, evenings. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.